I'm Nelson Cunningham. I'm the president of McClarty Associates. More importantly for these purposes, I'm the president of the American Security Project. And it's my real pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of our chair, Governor Christy Todd Whitman, uh, our chair emeritus, uh, Senator Gary Hart, and our founder, founders, uh, Secretary John Kerry and uh, former Secretary Chuck Hagel. Um, I have been a founding board member of ASP since it was begun in 2005, 2006, uh, by then Senator John Kerry, who had just, just finished his run for president, and felt deeply that the national security conversation in that presidential election had been too partisan, had not been fact-based enough, had not been based on the true fundamentals of American security, and that pained him, and his solution was to create the American Security Project, a bipartisan think tank with a board drawn from those of left of the aisle, right of the aisle, uh, business people, and uh, from my perspective as a, as a longtime board member, very importantly, drawing on the, the ranks of former flag officers, former admirals, former generals, who ground the board's discussions, ground the staff's discussions, that everything we must do must be tied to the national security and what is really needed for the national security of the United States. Uh, today's session on TTIP fits right into, uh, fits right into this rubric because for America to be strong abroad, we must be strong at home. For our economy to be strong, we have to have the right economic ties with, you, with the rest of the world. And that ties us directly back to national security because if we, don't, you, if we can use our economic power to bind our allies with us, to shape the behavior of those who are not our allies, uh, then that immeasurably strengthens our hand and reduces the number of times we have to turn to uh, General Dan Christman's old colleagues in the, in the Army and the Department of Defense to solve our problems for us. Uh, today, we, our discussion is in three buckets. Uh, the first panel sitting before you is to talk about the geopolitics of TTIP, particularly between the United States and the EU directly. Uh, how does this fit into the US-EU relationship? Uh, how does this uh, uh, impact perhaps what's going on with Russia? How does this go on? How does this impact with what's with the, the Chinese? How does this help bind the US and the EU together? The second part of today's presentation uh, is a very special opportunity to hear from the Dutch trade minister, Lilian Plamen, who was here for the IMF World Bank meetings and will give us the Dutch the very important Dutch perspective uh, on TTIP, on the internal EU public debate and perhaps even the private debate that's going on at the ministerial level on how the Europeans are viewing uh, their side of this equation. And then the third panel will bring experts on the multilateral trading system uh, as well as on the emerging markets and how TTIP will impact those two important sectors. So we hope by the end of the afternoon uh, to have really covered, uh, covered this from three different critical perspectives. Uh, we've also arranged for the Congress to finally drop its version of TPA this afternoon. They very conveniently <laughs> delayed it from yesterday to today so we could drop it in the middle of today's session. And I've asked the ASP staff to keep us all alert, maybe some of you in the audience with devices, to alert us as to when TPA has been dropped. Uh, and then we'll all opine sagely about something we've never read. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a plan. <laughs> uh, I, would like to, I would like to thank uh, our sponsors this afternoon, uh, the Embassy of the Netherlands, and also APCO Worldwide. Dr. Joshua Walker is here from APCO. Thank you. Thank you for that. You'll see APCO's name on the screen, but we appreciate APCO's commitment to promoting this broad discussion. Uh, let me turn now to our first panel. Uh, we'll, have, we'll spend the next hour talking about TTIP, geopolitics, and its impact on USEU. You have the bios uh, with you, but let me give you just a brief introduction as we go down. You've got, I can't imagine a, a better panel. We have uh, 
Kurt Tong, who was the principal deputy assistant secretary of state at the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. He is Ambassador Charlie Rifkin's top aide, uh, is someone who brings uh, years of experience, much of it in Asia. Uh, he was DCM in Tokyo when, when I saw you last outside of the country uh, at our embassy at our embassy there. He's also uh, been based in Seoul, uh, is someone who understands not only the important economic context <coughs> broadly, uh, but in his current position as PDAS at the State Department and the Economic Bureau, uh, is, an, is an integral player in helping develop the strategy for moving forward on TPA, TTIP, and, and how we'll move that forward. To his right is General Dan Crispin, uh, who is uh, head of international government affairs at the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he is also former commandant at West Point, um, uh, is someone who uh, I've had the pleasure to serve with on the ASP board and is one of those retired officers that I mentioned before who just bring uh, such a breadth of vision and such a breadth of perspective uh, to solving the world's problems that goes far beyond the tools that he might have directly in front of him and it urges us to incorporate all of the tools that we have available. So thank Next you, Dan. Up. Next up. Thank you, Dan. For being here, we have next to him Dan Hamilton from uh, Johns Hopkins SICE, one of the leading experts on transatlantic relations, someone who was testifying. Were you just testifying this week, Dan? Uh, it was about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Uh, so he's a, he's a current advisor and participant in, in the process up on the Hill and someone who brings a great deal of support. And then lastly, uh, Charlie Reese, Ambassador, uh, I should say Ambassador Reese, who is now with the Rand Corporation but had a a uh, three-decade-long career uh, in the Foreign Service. He, he was the PDAS, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the European Bureau. Uh, he was in charge of US-EU dialogue and economic relations in that position. He was Ambassador to Greece, uh, Minister Counselor at the US Embassy in London, and also served at, uh, as Minister Counselor to our mission at the EU. So he brings also a long history on US EU relations. He's also going to tell us uh, how Greece is going to solve its problems. <laughs> uh, with that introduction, let me turn it over to Kurt Tong, and we'll go down the line, each, uh, each member to give his perspective on where we are today, and then we'll begin the discussion with the audience. How much time? Five minutes? Five minutes. Okay, good. So, good afternoon, everybody, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, as usual, when I participate on panels, I'm a bit intimidated because I have other people who are both uh, more intelligent and more informed than me um, participating. But and that's as, just in the audience. And that's just in the audience. <laughs> uh, and, and do look forward to the discussion um, once we uh, get done talking at you. I uh, very much look forward to speaking with you about uh, or conversing with you about this, this important topic. The, um, uh, but let me give you a couple government thoughts uh, to kick things off and, and, then, and then I'll find out if I'm wrong. The, um, uh, this is the American security project that we're, we're with today and it's important to think about trade policy, uh, particularly from the, from the State Department perspective, with an eye toward uh, the implications for security policy. That is, everyone's like, yeah, right, okay, got that. But let's think about that for a second, because um, if your goals overseas and security policy are uh, peace, then what goes with peace is prosperity. So we need to be fostering growth overseas. Um, if your goal is leadership on the part of the United States, we need to be out there shaping the rules for how prosperity is generated um, for two reasons. Uh, because we want it to actually be successful and that means rules which are inclusive and promote inclusive growth and are fair and transparent and, and lead towards smaller economies and, and broader swaths of existing populations to be participating in growth. And we also want uh, to influence those rules so that we benefit from that growth. And that's the other strategic element of trade policy is that the United States is now less than a fifth of the global economy. We used to be more. Um, that proportion is unlikely to rebound 
uh, as the rest of the world continues to, to increase its technological capabilities and compete with the United States. So in that context, it is all the more important for us to be competitive. And the way to be competitive when you are a high value added economy, producing the most complex and sophisticated goods and services uh, in, in the global economy is fair rules and clear rules and, and uh, an operating environment that is not to the disadvantage of US companies or, or US workers and farmers. So that's what we're about. Everyone knows that already, but it's important to, to, to make that linkage as we, as we forge forward with the dis, this discussion. Um, another, uh, so where does TTIP fit into this context? And why are we pursuing such a big uh, free trade agreement with such a big and complex partner as, as the European Union? There, there have been critical views of the current approach, which is basically surrounds a concentration on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the transatlantic partnership. Two big agreements, not a lot of little agreements, and not an exclusive focus on the multilateral approach in the WTO. And why is this the case? And let me, let me give you a couple uh, suggestions on the rationale behind agreements like TTIP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, first is that the, the multilateral system, which we are still extremely vested in and, and exert enormous energy in trying to use the WTO framework to achieve the best possible trade policy outcomes, with some success recently in specific sectors, uh, for example, the trade facilitation agreement, and hopefully information technology, and hopefully after that, environmental goods and services and government procurement. But the, the Doha round has been slow. I'm not gonna make any like quote worthy statements about its future, but, but it's been slow, and that's, you have that on the one hand. On the other hand, you have the reality of our political system with the balance of powers and Article II of the Constitution, which gives Congress the clear lead in setting the rules for US international trade. And in that context, doing lots of bilateral uh, agreements with smaller countries in quick succession takes a lot of political resources. And you find that, that even the the, a very basic free trade agreement with a relatively uncomplicated economy in a friendly situation with no complicating factors, even that requires a lot of effort um, to, to, uh, uh, to exert in order to actually realize the agreement. So bundling countries together, uh, either through the very, very convenient form, formation of the European Union from the US perspective, or through our approach in Asia is efficient. And also, another thing, it is effective because once you get into that group format, you actually don't have to be the sole supplier of ambition in the negotiation. You actually get ambition from other partners, cross-feeding into a peer pressure situation that leads to a greater outcome, as long as everyone wants to be at the table. And in, with, with both TPP and TTIP, the good news is that everyone in both of those agreements wants to be at the table and wants to succeed. And that's why we are uh, on the process, very far along in the process of succeeding in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and, and well on track uh, in the case of the, of the Transatlantic Partnership and getting to success on the agreement. So a little bit specific then about, and I won't go on much longer, on the question of TTIP itself and how it fits into our policy vis-a-vis -vis Europe. The, um, the US-EU uh, economic relationship is enormous. In this case, uh, E stands for enormous. I'm not, I'm not sure what U stands for. Enormous, U, um, something, sorry. That five trillion in investment across the Atlantic. That's a lot. $2.7 billion of trade each day, 365 days a year. 13 million jobs that, that are supported, didn't say created, don't give me any Pinocchios, supported by this trade. Okay? And that is, that is a fact, and that could be demonstrated by clear economic logic. So there, there are jobs being created, there's an enormous amount of activity here, and the European economy is a very sophisticated one. We are in 
uh, deep agreement on many aspects of this, of what we're hoping to achieve in having a high quality agreement on the tran transatlantic partnership. We both want to have high standards for environment, uh, good working conditions, uh, clear health and consumer protection, uh, and, and, and transparent rules which foster uh, investment and growth. And really, this is all based upon some significant shared values between uh, the United States and Europe and the members of the European Union. Um, we are open economies uh, demo uh, dominated by democracies. Uh, there is a lot of shared view about how the world, the global economic system should be, should be organized and what the objectives are. So in that context, there's every reason to be very confident that, that the Trans-Atlantic Partnership, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, will move relatively rapidly given all the complexity in, involved uh, to come to, to fruition uh, in, in the months ahead. The, um, uh, what happens when we have both of these agreements together? Two-thirds of global trade will be encompassed in a high-quality set of, of transparent, fair uh, trading rules and investment rules. Two-thirds is majority by almost any account of, of how the world is organized. And that, that is the objective, to have a situation where the default mechanism for the global economy is high quality rules. We're getting there. This is really important. This week is important uh, as, as part of this exercise. And there's every reason to be optimistic this is going to happen. Our timing is also good. European economy is looking a little bit better. Um, the, the, uh, the, the European Central Bank's policies uh, the approach towards fiscal policy, the drop in oil prices, all of these are creating a little bit more juice in, in, in Europe these days. Our own economy is relatively strong, so that increases confidence when you're at the negotiating table. Um, Greece was mentioned. I'll leave that to, to smarter minds at the table to, to di dissect uh, the prospects there. But, but more fundamentally, at the macro level, um, we're, in a, we're in a good position uh, acro across the Atlantic in terms of where the economies are and how they're approaching the, the, uh, the, the exercise of this agreement. And then finally, at the, at the diplomatic level, if you will, it is, it is both useful to have a unifying uh, agenda and, uh, and, and, and it helps in broad ways in the, in the common agenda setting for the United States and Europe across many issues around the world when you have an economic agenda which is fundamentally uh, a, po a, a plus, plus someone, not, not a uh, one fraught with friction and lots of, of, of uh, discord, but rather one that, that, that is a macro agenda aimed at a common shared objective. That will have significant benefits going forward in keeping the already extremely strong relationship between the United States and Europe uh, even stronger in addressing all the questions that, that that, that come up in encountering violent extremism and, and answering some of the, the fundamental questions on global development, um, pandemic disease, you name it. Having a strong US-EU partnership is, is a fundamental part of, of, of uh, addressing all those questions and the TTIP will make us um, as, as a team a, a, a stronger uh, transatlantic uh, force. So I will stop. But I want to give you that sense of ambition uh, and, and uh, optimism because that's, that's where we are. There is every reason to be both ambitious and optimistic as we look at the TTIP going forward. Thank Thanks you. very much, Ambassador Tong. Appreciate that. Uh, General Crispin. Thanks very much, Nelson and Kurt. Thanks for those wonderful remarks. I want to say a few words on the security and geostrategic implications of this from where I used to sit, and that was in the Army for 36 years, uh, and then for the last 13 years at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as you may know, is the country's largest business association. We have had at the top of our priority list for legislative advocacy, for lobbying, this deal and the sine qua non that makes it work, and that's Fast Track, the Trade Promotion Authority. Of all the issues that the Chamber is addressing now in Capitol Hill, the sort of forward edge of the battle area for the Chamber are these deals. 
the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the corollary to the Atlantic uh, deal, and fast track to make it all work. And we do it driven by the knowledge that strong economies provide the foundations for a strong national defense. And I'll weave that thought in in a few moments as I talk about why I think it's critical. But I thought one of the best statements to just sort of put this in military terms was offered by the Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, when he visited uh, the Asia-Pacific region last week. And he said, wrap up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the TPP is the equivalent of one aircraft carrier battle group in the Asia-Pacific region. That's what it means in terms of American presence and influence. Well, I would say on the European side, you get, the, you get uh, TTIP, and in my judgment, for reasons that I think will be clear in a moment, it's the equivalent of a forward deployed armored brigade in Poland or in the Baltics. There are huge geostrategic movements on the European continent. And I think you know from whence they uh, derive. And US forward presence, especially ground troops, have enormous impact. I judge TTIP in those terms. Now, going forward, I must say, I sleep with my boots on at night because I'm nervous. As a cadet at West Point, I hosted one afternoon Casey Stengel when he was up there with the New York Mets. They were playing Army's baseball team. And at the end of it, uh, Who won? Uh, the Mets did. <laughs> Even though it was the marvelous Mets yeah. period, they still beat West Point's baseball team, which was quite good. So they asked Casey this question. It's a classic Casey Stengel line about a particular series the Mets had lost, of course against the Phillies, and, and they said, so Casey, what, what happened? And Stengel said, well, we just made too many of the wrong mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm afraid of, the reason why I sleep with boots on the ground, is we really are, as Kurt was mentioning, at a crucial time here with respect to the passing of fast track. And we cannot make the wrong mistake with respect to this particular legislative struggle and then the deals that will emerge from that. Larry Summers wrote, I thought, a really insightful piece last week when he said uh, American leadership can easily fall off, can easily uh, decline as a result of one party that's reflexively anti-trade and a second party that's reflexively anti-international organizations. And already you see, just in the news today, when fast track is supposed to be dropped this afternoon, the usual suspects out of the woodwork trying to attack provision after provision in this deal. Again, it's hugely important, not just for the reasons Kurt mentioned, but for the reasons I'll try to spin here in a second on the defense and security side. So I think there are probably, as we move forward here, there are probably four reasons that I think make sense from a geostrategic perspective as to why passing this deal, TTIP and its corollary, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership in, um, in the Asia-Pacific region, why that makes enormous sense. Kurt has, I think, outlined well the first one. And that is, if this is consummated, it's a deal that solidifies two large economies that are open, liberal, market-oriented, and transparent. Why is that important? because the narrative about alternative economic organizations, much more authoritarian capitalist, has in certain circles acquired increasing attractiveness because what it can do to get bills through, to get infrastructure built, uh, to overcome political sclerosis in alternative economic systems and to unite the systems as Kurt has outlined who are transparent, who abide by the rule of law, I think is awfully important both for the narrative that those economic systems are known for, but for pushing back against alternative narratives. Issue number one. Issue number two, defense spending. Europe has for 15 years unilaterally disarmed. And in the next year, 2016, it looks as though only two countries, Estonia and the US, under NATO's 2% guidelines for defense spending as a percent of GDP, will achieve that for 2016 and beyond. And that's awfully worrisome. What TTIP can do is help in the economic growth. Again, Kurt discussed this. But it helps support 
the sort of guns versus butter narrative, or the missiles versus Merlot narrative in Europe. Some way that allows the coffers to be filled more robustly so the political tensions in arriving at appropriate defense spending can be lessened. I think that's awfully important for Europe uh, in particular, as it is for the United States. We cite as the Chamber of Commerce figures that if this is approved, roughly 130 to 140 billion a year each year is added to our GDP in addition to increasing the purchasing power of an American family by roughly $1,000. Those are important economic benefits, but they also have spin-offs, it seems to me, in terms of what it does for the defense spending narrative, the guns versus butter tension. Three, energy. I don't think there is a more important strategic development in the last 15 years than what's happened on the global energy market as a result of our developments with hydrofracking here. And you see the impact of that on oil prices. They're going up, obviously, over these last couple of days. But still, the geostrategic implications of that are enormous. So what's it mean for TTIP? Europe needs to diversify its energy sources. They're doing decently internally in terms of rationalizing and rerouting pipelines. But they need, most importantly, diversified external energy sources. Liquefied natural gas, in particular from the U.S., would be something uh, the Europeans both want and need. There is now, as I understand it, automatic authorization under existing laws for that. But what the Europeans want is more. They want a guarantee of that. TTIP is a way to provide it. And they also want U.S. crude exports. And if there is perhaps one political way ahead on this, it's to provide crude oil exports to U.S. trading partners, in particular to the EU. Seems to be a nice way to square the political circle. But in any event, looking at energy as a strategic outcome of this, of this deal is an awfully important perspective. Finally, number four, why is energy important? Why does Europe need to diversify its sources of supply? Because of what's happening to the east with our friend in Moscow, and that's Vladimir, of course. All of us have followed the narrative in Ukraine about what's happening with Novo Rossiya. But it seems to me there's, a, there's something that's even more significant, serious, and strategic than perhaps a potential land grab here following Minsk to, to head down to Crimea and provide a land bridge there, which, which I think lots of folks are worried about. General West Clark was just in town a couple of weeks ago talking to the Atlantic Council about that particular narrative. But what worries me most is this. For those of us that grew up in the Cold War, negotiating as I did with the Soviets under SALT II and CFE, the conventional forces in Europe, part of that narrative during the Cold War was an attempt to undermine the coherence, the, the solidity of the transatlantic relationship. That has never changed. If you look at the State of Union addresses now that Vladimir is giving, his his famous Moscow address when he rationalized the acquisition of Crimea. Yes, there's a Novo Russia component to this, but he is also dead set on trying to undercut this U.S.-European relationship that's been so critical since the late 1940s. And that narrative finds its way, finds its execution in one particular attempt now, and that's European sanctions. And Vladimir has some potential amigos here in the European constellation. Syriza in Greece, his friend Viktor Orban and the Fidesz party in Jobbik in Hungary. Podemos, the far left party in Spain. Swedish Democrats, the National Front in France. Every one of these entities are dead set against US economic incursion in the European space, bad mouthing the European Union itself, and efforts, especially in some of our most important trading partners like France, to disrupt this relationship that's at the heart of the transatlantic ties that I described earlier. And if you have any, have any doubts about this, just turn into your local cable television station called RT, and that's Russia today, and see their so-called experts. RT now has a narrative, now has viewers that exceed CNN 
and some of the some of the so-called experts that are pulled in here have this consistent narrative about U.S. economic incursion into the European space, uh, the, the frailties of the European Union, and the problems of deepening that relationship through TTIP. It's extremely worrisome. As Admiral Jim Stavridis, who's now the, uh, the dean at Fletcher, has said, if Vladimir Putin is uneasy about TTIP, something must be right in the deal. <laughs> so let me stop there. Um, Appreciate the time and look forward to your questions. Thanks, General Chris. And that was a really excellent geopolitical frame for our entire discussion. We'll turn now to uh, the Executive Director of the Transatlantic uh, Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins SICE, Dr. Hamilton. Thanks, Nelson. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just add on to uh, the comments that have been made, but frame them slightly uh, in a different way. I think the geopolitical arguments here are at least as important as the economic arguments. And if we allow the debate here on TTIP or the TPP to be reduced down to just sort of this, this these are just more, more trade agreements, we're kind of missing the point that it's, a, it's basically about repositioning the United States for the world it's facing, not the world it left behind. And to do that with a whole set of other partners. Um, and in terms of the transatlantic piece of this, it's about the U.S. and, the, and Europe repositioning their, themselves uh, for a world of much more diffuse economic power and intensified global competition uh, that reaches far beyond the economics. Even, uh, I want to talk about the, ec the economics of this. I'll, I'll wait a second. Uh, uh, even on the economics, which we do a lot of studies on, in fact, Kurt, I would say our updated numbers say it's a $5.5 trillion economy and 15 million people uh, employed on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, so uh, the, the important thing to think about is that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just getting distracted by it. Yeah. Uh, the simple distinction is that our economic relations with Asia, both European and American, are driven by trade. But our relations across the Atlantic are driven by investment. Uh, it's a simple distinction. It makes all the difference in how you understand the relative importance of each of our partners to, to the U.S. economy. It doesn't mean trade is not important across the Atlantic. It's just that the driver often tends to be the investment flows that American companies make or European companies. And they, you don't see the same phenomenon to that extent in Asia. So just keeping that in mind tells you a bit about why the TTIP is a trade investment partnership and it goes beyond just the trade issues. And I'll leave the economics of it just for that. There are three geopolitical uh, pieces I just want to mention. First of all, TTIP is important to the transatlantic community itself. Um, General mentioned some of this. I think there's a great concern in Europe today uh, that NATO has gone a little wobbly. Uh, there's a concern about sustained U.S. commitment to Europe, uh, about the American security commitment to Europe. And if you are uh, negotiating to basically lock in your economic fortune together. Uh, there is no better uh, second anchor uh, to NATO than a TTIP. It's not an economic NATO. I think in, America, in the United States, I think we, we understand that term. We use it quickly because people kind of get it. It's about us together, facing things together. In Europe, it doesn't, that, that term doesn't translate well because, of course, NATO to them is one big power and a lot of small powers, right? It was created because of, they, common perception because of a certain threat. Well, what's the threat? TTIP is a threat. Uh, it just creates all sorts of mis, uh, misperceptions. So I don't use the term, but it is a second anchor to NATO in terms of locking in the transatlantic community for the future, not in terms of old types of structures. Um, it's also important, I think, to Americans who I think over decades have looked at the European Union and kind of wondered a bit about it. Uh, is it uh, you know, an open uh, partner? Or is it really trying to build its own sort of internal uh, uh, focus? Uh, we can debate that, but a, a TTIP would be a strong signal to the United States that the European Union is an outward-looking partner ready to engage the U.S. in a whole series of, of international issues beyond its own borders. So it's, a, it's an element of reassurance, recommitment to our own relationship, uh, which is the foundation, as was mentioned, for our, our ability to do anything else anywhere else. So it's important to shore that up. The second, I think, argument is uh, tones of which we've heard is how, uh, what is our message now to rising powers in this world? Each of those powers are having their own debates uh, about how they relate to the international system. Do they accommodate themselves to it? Do they challenge it? And what has been our message to those countries 
as they have their debates. I would argue it's been a muddled message. Uh, each, the US and the EU have each gone to these third countries and each try to eke out some marginal advantage in a third market and end up usually with no advantage uh, and being played off against each other. Uh, so I think we have to have a stronger unified message because of what Kurt said. Uh, you know, our portion of the world economy is shrinking. Uh, we don't have the luxury to be complacent about whether we want to do these things or not. Time is not on our side. This is about where the repositioning becomes important. And I think TTIP is a signal of a vibrant assertion of a Western model that can work for its own people and can be, again, a model for many other people around the world. It's not aggressive, but it is assertive. Uh, and a no, no apologies initiative uh, about the type of uh, uh, market economies we believe in and, and the rules of law and everything else that support that. And that, by God, we're going to work on this together still uh, instead of being defensive about it. Uh, that has impact on other countries as they have their own debates. Uh, uh, for Brazil right now, for instance, they are having a big debate now about their current and past trade policies and how the, what this is all going to mean for them. We have a book, uh, Charlie and I did with others on the geopolitics of TTIP, where we have a chapter by Brazilian authors who ran all the numbers that if Brazil would be isolated from TTIP, what it would mean, and if Brazil would it, it align itself to the kind of ambition TTIP has, what it would mean. And the first category, it's bad for Brazil. They're going to be isolated. They're going to lose a lot. If they would step up and start to align and orient themselves to what we're trying to do, their estimate is about a 50, 60 percent boost in exports, both the United States and the EU from Brazil. A major, major difference in the outlook for Brazil's future. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's the elephant in the room when the EU goes and talks to Brazilians about uh, their future. It's already having an impact. Uh, take a country, even, uh, even an ally like Japan. I would venture to say uh, it wasn't only the fact that TPP was moving ahead without Japan, but Japan saw its two biggest allies also moving ahead without it uh, in a transatlantic initiative. And Japan's traditional policy was putting it sort of in a box. And the Doha round wasn't going anywhere. So uh, there were, uh, at least in part, and the fact that it's the other Western partners were moving in a different direction, I think, had some impact on changing Japan's basic position and why it's now, now we're talking about opening up the Japanese market where for decades we had not been successful. There's a lazy argument, I think, that uh, TPP and TTIP are about containing China. I think, that's, uh, I think that doesn't bear a lot of scrutiny when you look at it. It's really about the terms of China's integration into the world economy. It's not about isolation or containment, it's about what terms are important to integrate China into the world economy. We all, I think, have been favoring China's integration, but the terms matter. Uh, and this gives us a certain leverage to talk to the Chinese about those terms. And, I, and then coming to Russia, <coughs> I think the general said it well. Uh, I would phrase it in, in a somewhat different way, which is if you think about what TTIP really is, it is, as I said, an assertive message about a vibrant Western model that can work for its own people and for people who could <coughs> associate themselves with it, rooted in rule of law, respect for human rights, market economies. That is anathema to Vladimir Putin. That is the opposite of the model he's trying to come, and he perceives it now, it's clear, as a threat to his own hold on power at home, not only to, to his neighborhood. Uh, and if people in wider Europe, the space beyond the EU, had a sense that this model is working again, then the magnetism again of the West would, I think, uh, be a strong influence on people in Ukraine and other parts of that space, very turbulent, very violent, who don't know where their future is. And you have an active uh, uh, person in the Kremlin trying to create a different model. So uh, I think the Russians, having been ambivalent for many years about the EU, we know what they've thought about NATO, but They've always been ambivalent about the EU until recently. And I think the current crisis has made it very clear there has been a, a real change and a decision made in Moscow. The EU, qua EU, is also a threat. And you can see that now in a whole series of measures called active measures, the KGB used to call them, uh, to undermine so dissension, in fact, spread the notion of illiberal democracy within the EU itself, not just on its borders. So, uh, TTIP is a really very important message uh, about our commitment to each other and what we're prepared to do for Europe. The last 
uh, geopolitical piece I would mention is about the relationship to the rules-based multilateral system. If we believe that we could sign the Doha round tomorrow, uh, the US and the EU would always, I think, prefer that as first choice. But, uh, you know, it's a dead end at the moment. We haven't seen much progress. I think trade facilitation has been one bright spot. I would argue that we got that because of the TTIP and the TPP, frankly. Uh, but I'll come back to that. But the point is that the multilateral system didn't move us forward in those negotiations. And so we could sit in Geneva and be pure theoretically, uh, or we could be a, a, a bit more practical and take the second best theoretical option and maybe actually spring some things loose, which I think, as I said, I suggest we're seeing some signs that that's, in fact, happening. Uh, and even if we did sign the Doha round tomorrow, it wouldn't even address a whole series of issues the United States and the European Union face today uh, that we don't face with lots of other countries because of this deep integration across the Atlantic. It's, we are the forefront of globalization. Globalization is not happening out there somewhere else. It's happening actually first across the Atlantic because of the deep, deep ties our economies have. We have not drifted apart since the end of the Cold War. We've actually collided. Uh, and you see that uh, because of the, uh, the investment and other, other flows. So part of the TTIP is about issues that are you could call WTO plus. They are issues that are in the WTO framework, but are not on the table at Doha. And they're not going to get addressed anytime soon, and because the notion is you've got to do Doha first before you can do anything else. Well, that's stopping us from actually dealing with a whole lot of issues. And then, because of the nature of our economies, there's a whole another basket TTIP sort of represents, which I would call WTO extra. These are issues that we're facing today that aren't even on the radar screen in the WTO. And if we're not going to deal with them, they're not going to get dealt with. And it's just going to create more erosion and, 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 and issues between us as partners and allies. That's not in our interest. Uh, and why do we wait? Uh, why can't we tackle this uh, at the same time? Uh, we can chew gum and you know walk and chew gum at the same time. The transatlantic versus multilateral dichotomy here, I think, is a false choice. Uh, if we can presume multilateral initiatives where they show prospects and can continue at it, that should not prevent us from moving forward with this other track. And I think in the end, it'll show it's a way to jumpstart the international uh, rules-based order and maintain it and sustain it and take those rules and procedures into the future and to do it at a high level. And that's my last point about it, which is TTIP is about maintaining standards. It's not about lowering them. Uh, there's a big debate in Europe right now, particularly by some who sort of pit this as the, the old way of thinking, which is, you know, whose standards are better? How do you clean a chicken? You know, uh, these kinds of things. Um, and I think the times have changed. Uh, if we're going to spend all our time thinking about how we clean a chicken, we're going to get our clocks cleaned. Uh, by uh, uh, an erosion of our standards that are coming from, it's coming from elsewhere. So either we work together to make sure we align standards in, in very different ways at this level, or we each face increasingly an erosion of each of our standards, and we'll be talking about standards, consumer, labor, environment, all what you want at this level. That essentially what the TTIP is about, not about just opening up the Translate market. It's about how we reposition ourselves for this global economy to ensure that the values and the standards that we believe are important can be maintained and extended. That, I think, is the other part of the argument to the economics, per se, uh, and should be uh, emphasized far more than it has been so far. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Hamilton. Ambassador Reese. OK. Um, uh, coming at the end of the panel, I'm going to talk about TTIP in terms of five people. Christine Lagarde, Lane Kirkland, Vladimir Putin, Steve Jobs, and Henry Ford. <laughs> Let me uh, develop that as a, as a proposition. Uh, Christine Lagarde, you know, at the bank fund meetings this week, uh, everyone's concerned about growth. Uh, this, uh, a TTIP between the United States and the European Union is the best way to uh, give a fill up.
All right. Oh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Whether these people have high standards uh, of, of protection of labor and environment. Well, you know, that's what we've got with Europe. Europe has equal standards uh, of protection of labor and environment. And the big issue in NAFTA was whether or not labor and environmental um, uh, provisions would be in the agreement itself. Well, they're in this agreement. So uh, 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 Lane Kirkland, uh, uh, <laughs> from where he is now, would be very, very supportive of, of this TTIP idea. And that's another reason why this makes a lot of sense. And it made a lot of sense when he proposed it, but it makes even more sense now. Vladimir Putin, I won't belabor this, both, Dan, uh, uh, both Dan's uh, pointed out uh, how if it's something that Vladimir Putin hates, it ought to be something that we want to do for the, for the exact and opposite reason. I think that from what we can tell about uh, Russia's strategy, uh, uh, in addition to creating the bigger, larger Russia that's respected in the world and, and, and uh, has this momentum that, that we're all seeing, he also wants, as a, as a central element of his strategy, to split uh, the European Union from the United States. That is, for him, the big goal, the geopolitical goal that he is trying to achieve. And as you see him uh, looking for friends in Hungary, friends in Greece, friends anywhere else, he's trying to split the EU apart as the first stage in splitting uh, the EU from the United States. Having a robust and strong uh, uh, permanent commitment of a, of a free market, a single market between the United States and the European Union is the best possible uh, way to ensure against uh, Vladimir Putin succeeding. Steve Jobs. One of the things that I think is really most notable about uh, the prospect of a TTIP, Dan talks about how the trade relationship between the United States and the European Union is investment-led, and that's totally true. Big multinational companies with their assets are even small, international companies with the assets invest across the Atlantic to supply uh, customers with uh, their products. So Procter & Gamble invests in Germany and supplies toothpaste and uh, detergent uh, for uh, German consumers. Uh, Siemens invests in the United States and supplies switching gear and, uh, uh, for American utilities. That's been uh, 50 or 60 percent of the transatlantic trade uh, 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 structure has been that way. And, and that probably will remain the dominant way that uh, the United States and the European Union trade and invest with each other. But I think that this actually, and that, because just that's the, where the big, uh, big forces of our economies are, we are very large economies. But I think that that actually obscures a real potential that will, uh, of this agreement that will transform politics. And that has to do with the fact that the internet uh, will allow, if, uh, if we can eliminate tariffs and eliminate customs formalities, the internet will allow startups and new, uh, new ventures to actually supply customers on the other side of the Atlantic seamlessly in a way that wasn't possible 20 or 30 years ago. So you'll have a, uh, uh, some specialty cheddar producer in, uh, in Wisconsin will be able to take orders and supply overnight their cheeses if we can get the regulatory uh, and documentary requirements uh, to customers in France or, or, or uh, you know, southern Italy overnight with uh, UPS or FedEx. And this, in a sense, is a great inspiration to the startup nation. The idea that we can start up a new business and instead of only 300 million customers, we can supply 700 million customers with uh, consequent uh, uh, benefits for the new uh, venture capitalists to come. So I actually think that that will also be in little towns in uh, Kansas City or, uh, uh, or elsewhere around uh, the United States and Europe a great, great incentive uh, for and, and, and sort of proof positive that, uh, that uh, Washington and Brussels are actually doing something that makes a difference makes a difference to the average person, both as a consumer and as a supplier. To give you an example, when I was in Athens, one of the most successful Greek companies of the last decade is a small cosmetics company called Chorus. It's founded by a sort of a homeopathic pharmacist named George Chorus. And he had a little pharmacy and was making cosmetics. And uh, uh, people came in and they started 
giving them encouragement. He got some good packaging and started to supply it. Now, you can buy, of course, cosmetics in Bergdorf Gumbin in New York. But wouldn't it be much better for George if he could sell his cosmetics overnight uh, uh, by, uh, delivered by UPS to Sacramento? This would be terrific. And this is the kind of stimulus that a, the private sector, small startup in a place peripheral to, to Europe like, uh, like Greece needs. And finally, Henry Ford. Uh, Dan really talked about this, the standards, the question of, of, of standards and how they can be made uh, uh, so that they don't interrupt and, and, and serve as an obstacle in US European trade, but also that they can stay high. I mean, we, the United States and the European Union, collectively have the highest product standards that there are. Uh, but in automobiles in particular, we saw product standards that, while high, were not compatible. It was ridiculous. The height of the bumper was different. What difference does it make? Uh, in fact, the United States actually was much more um, proactive and much more uh, precautionary from the standpoint of the European uh, ideas in, in, in automobile standards for many years. We had uh, uh, headrests before the Europeans had headrests. We had seatbelt laws. We had uh, all kinds of uh, safety provisions before European autos did. But the point of this agreement was that, well, for many years, we tried to, to tackle the regulatory barriers to trade, a decade or more through lots of different uh, bureaucratic enterprises to try and get the regulatory barriers down. It was not possible to deal with the many lobbies and regulatory agencies in the context of sort of business as usual. But in the context of a big TTIP-like agreement, it will be much easier to get those harmonized standards without uh, 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 giving up on the, uh, on, the, on the level of protection, which is obviously a political non-starter, should it be that we would try to reduce the level of protection. So Christine Lagarde, Lane Kirkland, Vladimir Putin, Steve Jobs, and Henry Ford, they all vote for this, and I do too. All right. <laughs> That's a, great, that's a great way to put it. Let's go ahead and open it up directly to the floor. We've got a microphone in the back. Anybody who cares to have a question, please raise your hands. While you're thinking about your questions, let me put this, let me put this to, the, uh, to our group. Uh, you've made very sophisticated arguments. And I don't mean that as an insult. You've made very sophisticated <laughs> arguments uh, in favor of TTIP. Uh, to what extent do you think that the geopolitical arguments are understood by the publics in, in the EU countries, in the United States? And if you think they, uh, what could we do to help them understand those arguments better? Dan, why don't I start with you? I think there's a general loose understanding of what this all means. I've just been struck by how little the geostrategic component have of, of these uh, deals has been stressed in the debates. At, at a time when the other half of the U.S.-European debate is sanctions against Russia. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I, I've rarely heard an argument, that's why I said what I said about um, where the sanctions regime has um, is potentially unraveling as a result of the, of the efforts from the information campaign uh, directed by Moscow and some of the friends that are emerging. But you know, Nelson, in the end, this is, this is where the chamber uh, for CAFTA, for the Central American Free Trade Deal, for Colombia, for Panama, for Korea, in the end, what we did to try to sell this was to work what we called the grassroots. We, we had to go to the particular districts. And it's a, it's a very uh, strategic sort of operational exercise to map out the, the key districts where we think, uh, where our advocates on the Hill think there are um, congressmen and women who are open-minded about this and where in their districts there are constituencies. I think the arguments, uh, gosh, that uh, Ambassador Reese mentioned were just superb to stress how, how this really impacts in Lima, 
uh, Ohio or Topeka, uh, Kansas, when, when these um, congressmen and women come to the point where they have to cast this vote. Ultimately, what we try to do is make the grassroots advocacy the most important determinant because it really does affect the jobs in their, in their districts and the votes for the, for the deal ultimately. On the other side of the pond, I might ask uh, Ambassador Reese or Dr. Hamilton, who know, who know Europe so well. Uh, well, I think uh, it's, it, it's been an unfortunate debate in Europe. Uh, it, it, it comes at a time when Brussels and the European Union institutions are under unprecedented attack having nothing to do with TTIP, but TTIP as an initiative of the European Union. It was, we need to remember, this was a proposal that came first from Angela Merkel, and secondly was espoused by the EU and brought to the United States. And on the basis of that, there was a working group that looked at it and laid out the negotiations objectives. But the EU is unpopular. In Southern Europe, it's unpopular because it's a, it's a kind of home and sort of source of austerity. In Northern Europe, it's unpopular because it's supposedly the protector of the deadbeats in the South. Uh, in Britain, it's, it's unpopular. The EU in Brussels is unpopular for reasons unique to the, to the UK. And, and uh, so it's tough. And then there has been this really a year's worth of um, a lot of very uh, uh, pejorative uh, description of uh, the value of a dispute settlement mechanism uh, that would be in the agreement without any discussion about the, the, the uh, obligations that would be subject to this dispute settlement uh, mechanism. I think that we're making progress on that. I think the Europeans have, have, have worked their way through and the actual the advantage of them recently signing an agreement with Canada uh, has shown that this is really not as much. But the, in, in Europe, the scope has been large, the, 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 the proponents have been uh, relatively muted and the opponents have been very strong. Now, part of that is natural with any trade agreement. When I was doing NAFTA, I was amazed at how all we heard about in the early phases of NAFTA was, was opposition. Because people are opposed to it, they know they're opposed to it. They don't really care what the provisions are. But supporters actually care what the provisions are, and they're sort of careful not to come in with both feet in favor because they figure that then their, their interests will be traded off by an administration that puts them in their pocket and, and, and then focuses on the people on the, on the fence. So I think that's a factor as well. Uh, we're starting to see uh, uh, business uh, interests and, 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 and those uh, in Europe who understand that the United States is an important part uh, of, uh, of uh, Europe's own security and, and, and growth. I've, had the privilege of speaking on this subject in uh, the Baltics. Uh, Kurt and I were together in Vilnius talking about it. And they are very focused on Vladimir Putin. And I also spoke in northern Italy where, you know, it's funny, the northern Italians, I mean, their, their exports, Parma ham and, and leather goods and, and cheeses and so forth, they really are subject, and textiles, ties, they're subject to the highest tariffs the United States has, and they would be a big beneficiary. And so the, what, what Europeans will have to do is make the case to the sub parts of their own uh, very complex society as to why keeping the U.S. committed to them, keeping their access to the U.S. market, I mean, what happens to them if the United States does TPP and they decide not to do TTIP with the United States. Where is their growth going to come from in the future? I don't know. Ambassador Tong, to wrap up on this question, if anybody out there does have a question, please raise, because we do have a couple. I, th I thought the way you framed this was interesting, because the, what comes to mind is the um, situation where you have two kids in the back seat, and one of them is misbehaving, and one of them is, is being an angel. And which child do you pay attention to, mm -hmm. right? And there, there, is, there is a phenomenon in global affairs of taking your friends for granted. And that is really the, uh, a, a, that becomes a problem when you have a situation like between the United States and Europe where we are so uh, like-minded on many issues that one looks beyond that 
and think and takes it for granted that oh yes well we agree on so much so let's just not work on our relationship and that is not a good thing and this is a this economic element is like I said previously a positive some aspect of our relationship it's going to require hard work like any marriage but it's worth it because of the fundamental foundation that will get stronger as a result. Good. Let me ask our ASP staff, uh, is it all right if we keep on running here? We've got a lot of questions in the room. One more question. Well, let's, let's have the three, there are three people have their hands up, here, here, and here. Put your three questions out and then we'll, then we'll get quick answers to all of them. Yes, hi. Um, so it seemed that the administration and much of the U.S. was caught off guard whenever many of our allies signed on to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And it seemed to be that the reason why so many countries were getting on board was because of the kind of vision that China and the other BRICS nations are presenting. You know, the, the, the new Silk Road, the we'll Maritime have, we'll Silk Road development. We'll have to keep these questions short. Yeah. Okay, so, so my question yeah. is, it seems that we're losing the battle of providing a vision to the world to show like, hey, we're promoting a development perspective, whereas, you know, we're talking about still sort of old relics of, of old geopolitical strategies as opposed to what President Xi has called a win-win strategy of nation building. Okay, so if you good. could address that. Good. We'll go uh, two people ahead here and then the gentleman over here in the blue, uh, in the blue shirt. John Peterson, University of Edinburgh and Center for Transatlantic Relations. To what extent is TTIP disadvantaged by the fact that there seems to be a sequence here. First TPA, second TPP, third TTIP. Good question. Yes, sir. Tom Oakland, National Economist Club. Uh, a quick question, sort of with globalization now being seen as sort of a dirty word and the uh, income inequality, how does uh, TTIP uh, get to the you know, ordinary person? Good. Uh, and Let's start with, uh, with Ambassador Reese. We'll work our way this way. Don't feel obliged to answer every question. Just pick the most interesting one, move down, and we'll conclude okay. this panel uh, only a little over time. Okay, I think I can do them all pretty quickly. I think the <coughs> AIIB, first of all, it's possible to pronounce. Uh, I think that that is not a fundamental uh, uh, decision that's just badly managed. Uh, I think the Treasury had the lead. It's Bretton Woods Institutions, Uber, all this. And uh, that I don't think, I wouldn't read a bigger uh, objective into that. To uh, John Peterson's question about the sequencing, I thought in 2009, in my first, in my first contribution to Dan's book, uh, Dan's other book, I thought uh, 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 a TAFTA, as we called it then, or a TTIP would have been much, much better. First of all, we'd get better terms out of a TPP if we had been a, done a TTIP first. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but the administration was committed to the pivot to Asia and uh, they were content to wait for the Europeans to kind of come to them. And so seek consequences uh, we're living with. And on globalization, uh, income equality, I, I, I try to t capture that with the Lane Kirkland thing. I mean, it, 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 it's a, this is not a big agreement, the TTIP part, is not a big agreement that has huge globalization uh, or, or even NAFTA-like implications because uh, average wages in Europe are very high. Uh, average standards are very high. There's, there's not a debate about whether we're pulling the rest of the world up or being brought down. Uh, the, the, the differences between the United States and the European Union are relatively in, infinitesimal, both in income and in sort of standards, protection, and, and you know, labor rights and all those other issues. Yeah, uh, just quickly on those, you know, I think the, on, the, on the Asian issue, there was a tactical uh, difference between some Europeans who thought the way you influence that is by being in, in the group versus the U.S. approach that you, you hold out and that's how you best influence. I think it's also influenced by different perspectives on economic interests in Asia, whereas we have a broader strategic uh, view of our uh, responsibilities and frankly the EU has more of a one-dimensional view of how they're engaged in Europe I mean in Asia and you know economic interests start to start to weigh out so I think there is an influence there I think the other uh, lesson out of this though is that uh, as the president said who's writing the rules uh, and I think what you see is that the rules are being written more and more in regional groupings than in the multilateral settings and so all of these TPP, AIIB, TTIP, you name it, 
this is where the rules of the future are being written more and more, not at the global level. They're going to come to that level, but it's more of a debate, and we should keep that in mind. The last piece, I think, was actually some of our allies looking at our own dysfunctional, polarized political system and saying, we, you know, we're dependent on these guys, uh, and they don't seem to be able to get back to management problems. They don't seem to be getting their act together. Uh, there were efforts years ago to change voting rules in some of the multilateral institutions stuck in the Congress. Uh, you know, different branches of the government tr basically trying to beat each other up. And countries who are dependent on us being coherent look at this and take their own conclusion. So I think that's maybe a lesson uh, back to the implications, the ripples of our dysfunctional polarization at the moment. On TPP versus TTIP, uh, you know, my I, 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 just to telegraph it quickly, I think there's a distinction here. It's about us together facing things together. In Europe, it doesn't, that, that term doesn't translate well because, of course, NATO to them is one big power and a lot of small powers, right? It was created because of they, uh, common perception because of a certain threat. Well, what's the threat? TTIP is a threat. Uh, it just creates all sorts of mis, uh, misperceptions. So I don't use the term, but it is a second anchor to NATO in terms of locking in the translated community for the future, not in terms of old types of structures. Um, it's also important, I think, to Americans who I think over decades have looked at the European Union and kind of wondered a bit about it. Uh, is it, uh, you know, an open uh, partner or is it really trying to build its own sort of internal uh, f uh, focus? Uh, we can debate that, but a, a TTIP would be a strong signal to the United States that the European Union is an outward-looking partner ready to engage the U.S. in a whole series of, of international issues beyond its own borders. So. It's, a, it's an element of reassurance, recommitment to our own relationship, uh, which is the foundation, as was mentioned, for our, our ability to do anything else anywhere else. So it's important to shore that up. The second, I think, argument is uh, tones of which we've heard is how, uh, what is our message now to rising powers in this world? Each of those powers are having their own debates uh, about how they relate to the international system. Do they accommodate themselves to it? Do they challenge it? And what has been our message to those countries as they have their debates? I would argue it's been a muddled message. Uh, each, the US and the EU have each gone to these third countries and each try to eke out some marginal advantage in a third market and end up usually with no advantage uh, and being played off against each other. Uh, so I think we have to have a stronger unified message because of what Kurt said. Uh, you know, our portion of the world economy is shrinking. Uh, we don't have the luxury to be complacent about whether we want to do these things or not. Time is not on our side. This is about where the repositioning becomes important. And I think TTIP is a signal of a vibrant assertion of a Western model that can work for its own people and can be, again, a model for many other people around the world. It's not aggressive, but it is assertive. Uh, and and no, no apologies initiative. Uh, about the type of, uh, of market economies we believe in and, and the rules of law and everything else that support that, and that, by God, we're going to work on this together still, uh, instead of being defensive about it. Uh, that has impact on other countries as they have their own debates. Uh, uh, for Brazil right now, for instance, they are having a big debate now about their current and past trade policies and how the, what this is all going to mean for them. We have a book uh, Charlie and I did with others on the geopolitics of TTIP where we have a chapter by Brazilian authors who ran all the numbers that if Brazil would be isolated from TTIP, what it would mean, and if Brazil would it, it align itself to the kind of ambition TTIP has, what it would mean. And the first category, it's bad for Brazil. They're going to be isolated. They're going to lose a lot. If they would step up and start to align and orient themselves to what we're trying to do, their estimate is about a 50, 60 percent boost in exports, both the United States and the EU from Brazil. A major, major difference in the outlook for Brazil's future. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's the elephant in the room when the EU goes and talks to Brazilians about uh, their future. It's already having an impact. Uh, take a country, even, uh, even an ally like Japan. I would venture to say uh, it wasn't only the fact that TPP was moving ahead without Japan, but Japan saw its two biggest allies also moving ahead without it uh, in a transatlantic initiative. And Japan's traditional policy was putting it sort of in a box. And the Doha round wasn't going anywhere. So uh, there were, uh, at least in part, 
the, the fact that it's the other Western partners were moving in a different direction, I think, had some impact on changing Japan's basic position and why it's now, now we're talking about opening up the Japanese market where for decades we had not been successful. There's a lazy argument, I think, that uh, TPP and TTIP are about containing China. I think, that's, uh, I think that doesn't bear a lot of scrutiny when you look at it. It's really about the terms of China's integration into the world economy. It's not about isolation or containment. It's about what terms are important to integrate China into the world economy. We all, I think, have been favoring China's integration, but the terms matter. Uh, and this gives us a certain leverage to talk to the Chinese about those terms. And, I, and then coming to Russia, <coughs> I think the general said it well. Uh, I would phrase it in, in a somewhat different way, which is if you think about what TTIP really is, it is, as I said, an assertive message about a vibrant Western model that can work for its own people and for people who could <coughs> associate themselves with it, rooted in rule of law, respect for human rights, market economies. That is anathema to Vladimir Putin. That is the opposite of the model he's trying to come, and he perceives it now, it's clear, as a threat to his own hold on power at home, not only to, to his neighborhood. Uh, and if people in wider Europe, the space beyond the EU, had a sense that this model is working again, then the magnetism again of the West would, I think, uh, be a strong influence on people in Ukraine and other parts of that space, very turbulent, very violent, who don't know where their future is. And you have an active uh, uh, person in the Kremlin trying to create a different model. So uh, I think the Russians, having been ambivalent for many years about the EU, we know what they've thought about NATO, but they've always been ambivalent about the EU until recently. And I think the current crisis has made it very clear there has been a, a real change and a decision made in Moscow. The EU EU is also a threat. And you can see that now in a whole series of measures called active measures, the KGB used to call them, uh, to undermine so dissension, in fact spread the notion of illiberal democracy within the EU itself, not just on its borders. So uh, TTIP is a really very important message uh, about our commitment to each other and what we're prepared to do for Europe. The last uh, geopolitical piece I would mention is about the relationship to the rules-based multilateral system. If we believe that we could sign the Doha round tomorrow, uh, the U.S. and the EU would always, I think, prefer that as first choice. But, uh, you know, it's a dead end at the moment. We haven't seen much progress. I think trade facilitation has been one bright spot. I would argue that we got that because of the TTIP and the TPP, frankly. Uh, but I'll come back to that. But the point is that the multilateral system didn't move us forward in those negotiations. And so we could sit in Geneva and be pure theoretically, uh, or we could be a, a bit more practical and take the second best theoretical option and maybe actually spring some things loose, which I think, as I said, I suggest we're seeing some signs that that's in fact happening. Uh, and even if we did sign the Doha round tomorrow, it wouldn't even address a whole series of issues the United States and the European Union face today uh, that we don't face with lots of other countries because of this deep integration across the Atlantic. It's, we are the forefront of globalization. Globalization is not happening out there somewhere else. It's happening actually first across the Atlantic because of the deep, deep ties our economies have. We have not drifted apart since the end of the Cold War. We've actually collided. Uh, and you see that uh, because of the, uh, the investment and other, other flows. So part of the TTIP is about issues that are you could call WTO plus. They are issues that are in the WTO framework but are not on the table at Doha. And they're not going to get addressed anytime soon and because the notion is you've got to do Doha first before you can do anything else. Well, that's stopping us from actually dealing with a whole lot of issues. And then, because of the nature of our economies, there's a whole no, another basket TTIP sort of represents, which I would call WTO extra. These are issues that we're facing today that aren't even on the radar screen in the WTO. And if we're not going to deal with them, they're not going to get dealt with. And it's just going to create more erosion and, 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 and issues between us as partners and allies. That's not in our interest. Uh, and why do we wait? Uh, why can't we tackle this uh, at the same time? Uh, we can chew gum and you know walk and chew gum at the same time. The transatlantic versus multilateral dichotomy here, 
I think is a false choice. Uh, if we can pursue multilateral initiatives where they show prospects and con continue at it, that should not prevent us from moving forward with this other track. And I think in the end it'll show it's a way to jumpstart the international uh, rules-based order and maintain it and sustain it and take those rules and procedures into the future and to do it at a high level. And that's my last point about it, which is TTIP is about maintaining standards. It's not about lowering them. Uh, there's a big debate in Europe right now, particularly by some who sort of pit this as the, the old way of thinking, which is, you know, whose standards are better? How do you clean a chicken? You know, uh, these kinds of things. Um, and I think the times have changed. Uh, if we're going to spend all our time thinking about how we clean a chicken, we're going to get our clocks cleaned. Uh, by uh, uh, an erosion of our standards that are coming from, it's coming from elsewhere. So either we work together to make sure we align standards in, in very different ways at this level, or we each face increasingly an erosion of each of our standards, and we'll be talking about standards, consumer, labor, environment, all what you want at this level. That essentially what the TTIP is about, not about just opening up the Translate market, it's about how we reposition ourselves for this global economy to ensure that the values and the standards that we believe are important can be maintained and extended. That, I think, is the other part of the argument to the economics, per se, uh, and should be uh, emphasized far more than it has been so far. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Hamilton. Ambassador Reese. Okay. Um, uh, coming at the end of the panel, I'm going to talk about TTIP in terms of five people. It's Ian Lagarde, Lane Kirkland, Vladimir Putin, Steve Jobs, and Henry Ford. <laughs> Let me uh, develop that as a, as a proposition. Uh, Christine Lagarde, you know, at the bank fund meetings this week, uh, everyone's concerned about growth. Uh, this, uh, a TTIP between the United States and the European Union is the best way to uh, give a fill up. All right. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Whether these people have high standards uh, of, of protection of labor and environment. Well, you know, that's what we've got with Europe. Europe has equal standards uh, of protection of labor and environment. And the big issue in NAFTA was whether or not labor and environmental um, uh, provisions would be in the agreement itself. Well, they're in this agreement. So uh, uh, Lane Kirkland, uh, uh, <laughs> from where he is now, would be very, very supportive of, of this TTIP idea. And that's another reason why this makes a lot of sense. And it made a lot of sense when he proposed it, but it makes even more sense now. Vladimir Putin, I won't belabor this, but Dan, uh, uh, both Dan's uh, pointed out uh, how if it's something that Vladimir Putin hates, it ought to be something that we want to do for the, for the exact and opposite reason. I think that from what we can tell about uh, Russia's strategy, 
uh, uh, in addition to creating the bigger, larger Russia that's respected in the world and, and, and uh, has this momentum that, that we're all seeing, he also wants, as a, as a central element of his strategy, to split uh, the European Union from the United States. That is, for him, the big goal, the geopolitical goal that he is trying to achieve. And as you see him uh, looking for friends in Hungary, friends in Greece, friends anywhere else, he's trying to split the EU apart as the first stage in splitting uh, the EU from the United States. Having a robust and strong uh, uh, permanent commitment of a, of a free market, a single market between the United States and the European Union is the best possible uh, way to ensure against uh, Vladimir Putin succeeding. Steve Jobs. One of the things that I think is really most notable about uh, the prospect of a TTIP, Dan talks about how the trade relationship between the United States and the European Union is investment-led, and that's totally true. Big multinational companies with their assets, or even small international companies with the assets, invest across the Atlantic to supply uh, customers with uh, their products. So Procter & Gamble invests in Germany and supplies toothpaste and uh, detergent uh, for uh, German consumers. Uh, Siemens invests in the United States and supplies switching gear and, uh, uh, for American utilities. That's been uh, 50 or 60 percent of the transatlantic trade uh, 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 structure has been that way. And, and that probably will remain the dominant way that uh, the United States and the European Union trade and invest with each other. But I think that this actually, and that because just that's the, where the big, uh, big forces of our economies are. We are very large economies. But I think that that actually obscures a real potential that will, uh, of this agreement that will transform politics. And that has to do with the fact that the internet uh, will allow, if, uh, if we can eliminate tariffs and eliminate customs formalities, the internet will allow startups and new uh, new ventures to actually supply customers on the other side of the Atlantic seamlessly in a way that wasn't possible 20 or 30 years ago. So you'll have a, uh, uh, some specialty cheddar producer in, uh, in Wisconsin will be able to take orders and supply overnight their cheeses if we can get the regulatory uh, and documentary requirements uh, to customers in France or, cheddar. or, or uh, you know, southern Italy overnight with uh, UPS or FedEx. And this, in a sense, is a great inspiration to the startup nation. The idea that we can start up a new business and instead of only 300 million customers, we can supply 700 million customers with uh, consequent uh, uh, benefits for the new uh, venture capitalists to come. So I actually think that that will also be in little towns in uh, Kansas City or, uh, uh, or elsewhere around uh, the United States and Europe a great, great incentive uh, for and, and, and sort of proof positive that, uh, that uh, Washington and Brussels are actually doing something that makes a difference. It makes a difference to the average person, both as a consumer and as a supplier. I'll give you an example, when I was in Athens, one of the most successful Greek companies of the last decade is a small cosmetics company called Chorus. It's founded by a sort of a homeopathic pharmacist named George Chorus. And he had a little pharmacy and was making cosmetics. And uh, uh, people came in and they started giving him encouragement. He got some good packaging and started to supply it. Now you can buy Chorus cosmetics in Bergdorf Gumbin in New York. But wouldn't it be much better for George if he could sell his cosmetics overnight uh, uh, by, uh, delivered by UPS to Sacramento? This would be terrific. And this is the kind of stimulus that a, the private sector, small startup in a place peripheral to, to Europe like, uh, like Greece needs. And finally, Henry Ford. Uh, Dan really talked about this, the standards, the question of, of, of standards and how they can be made uh, uh, so that they don't interrupt and, and, and serve as an obstacle in U.S. European trade, but also that they can stay high. I mean, we, the United States and the European Union, collectively have the highest product standards that there are. Uh, but in automobiles in particular, we saw product standards that, while high, were not compatible 
was ridiculous. The height of the bumper was different. What difference does it make? Uh, in fact, the United States actually was much more um, proactive and much more uh, precautionary from the standpoint of the European uh, ideas in, in, in automobile standards for many years. We had uh, uh, headrests before the Europeans had headrests. We had seatbelt laws. We had uh, all kinds of uh, safety provisions before European autos did. But the point of this agreement was that, well, for many years, we tried to, to tackle the regulatory barriers to trade, a decade or more through lots of different uh, bureaucratic enterprises to try and get the regulatory barriers down. It was not possible to deal with the many lobbies and regulatory agencies in the context of sort of business as usual. But in the context of a big TTIP-like agreement, will be much easier to get those harmonized standards without uh, 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 giving up on the, uh, on, the, on the level of protection, which is obviously a political non-starter, should it be that we would try to reduce the level of protection. So Christine Lagarde, Lane Kirkland, Vladimir Putin, Steve Jobs, and Henry Ford, they all vote for this, and I do too. All right. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great way to put it. Let's go ahead and open it up directly to the floor. We've got a microphone in the back. Anybody who cares to have a question, please raise your hands. While you're thinking about your questions, let me put this, let me put this to, the, uh, to our group. Uh, you've made very sophisticated arguments. And I don't mean that as an insult. You've made very sophisticated <laughs> arguments uh, in favor of TTIP, uh, to what extent do you think that the geopolitical arguments are understood by the publics in, in the EU countries, in the United States? And if you think they, uh, what could we do to help them understand those arguments better? Dan, why don't I start with you? I think there's a general loose understanding of what this all means. I've just been struck by how little the geostrategic component have of, of these uh, deals has been stressed in the debates. At, at a time when the other half of the U.S.-European debate is sanctions against Russia. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I, I've rarely heard an argument, that's why I said what I said about um, where the sanctions regime has um, is potentially unraveling as a result of the, of the efforts from the information campaign uh, directed by Moscow and some of the friends that are emerging. But you know, Nelson, in the end, this is, this is where the chamber uh, for CAFTA, for the Central American Free Trade Deal, for Colombia, for Panama, for Korea, in the end, what we did to try to sell this was to work what we called the grassroots. We, we had to go to the particular districts and it's a, it's a very uh, strategic sort of operational exercise to map out the, the key districts where we think, uh, where our advocates on the Hill think there are um, congressmen and women who are open-minded about this and where in their districts there are constituencies. I think the arguments, uh, gosh, that uh, Ambassador Reese mentioned were just superb to stress how, how this really impacts in Lima, uh, Ohio or Topeka, uh, Kansas, when, when these um, congressmen and women come to the point where they have to cast this vote. Ultimately, what we try to do is make the grassroots advocacy the most important determinant because it really does affect the jobs in, the, in their districts and the votes for the, for the deal ultimately. On the other side of the pond, I might ask uh, Ambassador Reese or Dr. Hamilton, who know, who know Europe so well. Uh, well, I think uh, it's, it, it's been an unfortunate debate in Europe. Uh, it, it, it comes at a time when Brussels and the European Union institutions are under unprecedented attack, 
having nothing to do with TTIP, but TTIP as an initiative of the European Union. It was, we need to remember, this was a proposal that came first from Angela Merkel, and secondly was espoused by the EU and brought to the United States. And on the basis of that, there was a working group that looked at it and laid out the negotiations objectives. But the EU is unpopular. In Southern Europe, it's unpopular because it's a, it's a kind of home and sort of source of austerity. In Northern Europe, it's unpopular because it's supposedly the protector of the deadbeats in the South. Uh, in Britain, it's, it's unpopular. The EU in Brussels is unpopular for reasons unique to, to, to the UK. And, and uh, so it's tough. And then there has been this really a year's worth of um, a lot of very uh, uh, pejorative uh, description of uh, the value of a dispute settlement mechanism uh, that would be in the agreement without any discussion about the, the, the uh, obligations that would be subject to this dispute settlement uh, mechanism. I think that we're making progress on that. I think the Europeans have, have, have worked their way through and the actual the advantage of them recently signing an agreement with Canada uh, has shown that this is really not as much. But the, in, in Europe, the scope has been large. The, 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 the proponents have been uh, relatively muted and the opponents have been very strong. Now, part of that is natural with any trade agreement. When I was doing NAFTA, I was amazed at how all we heard about in the early phases of NAFTA was, was opposition. Because people are opposed to it, they know they're opposed to it. They don't really care what the provisions are. But supporters actually care what the provisions are, and they're sort of careful not to come in with both feet in favor because they figure that then their, their interests will be traded off by an administration that puts them in their pocket and, and, and then focuses on the people on the, on the fence. So I think that's a factor as well. Uh, we're starting to see uh, uh, business uh, interests and, 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 and those uh, in Europe who understand that the United States is an important part uh, of, uh, of uh, Europe's own security and, and, and growth. I've, had the privilege of speaking on this subject in uh, the Baltics. Uh, Kurt and I were together in Vilnius talking about it. And they are very focused on Vladimir Putin. And I also spoke in northern Italy where, you know, it's funny, the northern Italians, I mean, their, their exports, Parma ham and, and leather goods and, and cheeses and so forth, they really are subject, and textiles, ties, they're subject to the highest tariffs the United States has, and they would be a big beneficiary. And so the, what, what Europeans will have to do is make the case to the sub parts of their own uh, very complex society as to why keeping the U.S. committed to them, keeping their access to the U.S. market, I mean, what happens to them if the United States does TPP and they decide not to do TTIP with the United States. Where is their growth going to come from in the future? I don't know. Ambassador Tong, to wrap up on this question, if anybody out there does have a question, please raise, could we do have a couple? I, th I thought the way you framed this was interesting because the, what comes to mind is the um, situation where you have two kids in the back seat, and one of them is misbehaving, and one of them is, is being an angel. And which child do you pay attention to, mm -hmm. right? And there, there, is, there is a phenomenon in global affairs of taking your friends for granted. And that is really the, uh, a, a, that becomes a problem when you have a situation like between the United States and Europe where we are so uh, like-minded on many issues that one looks beyond that and, think, and takes it for granted that, oh yes, well we agree on so much, so let's just not work on our relationship. And that is not a good thing. And this is a, this economic element is, like I said previously, a positive some aspect of our relationship. It's gonna require hard work, like any marriage, but it's worth it because of the fundamental foundation that will get stronger as a result. Good. Let me ask our ASP staff, uh, is it all right if we keep on running here? We've got a lot of questions in the room. One more question. Well, let's, let's have the three, there are three people have their hands up, here, here, and here. 
put your three questions out, and then we'll, then we'll get quick answers to all of them. Yes, hi. Um, so it seemed that the administration and much of the U.S. was caught off guard whenever many of our allies signed on to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And it seemed to be that the reason why so many countries were getting on board was because of the kind of vision that China and the other BRICS nations are presenting. You know, the, the, the new Silk Road, the we'll Maritime have, we'll Silk Road development. We'll have to keep these questions short. Yeah. Okay, so, so my question yeah. is, it seems that we're losing the battle of providing a vision to the world to show, like, hey, we're promoting a development perspective, whereas, you know, we're talking about still sort of old relics of, of old geopolitical strategies as opposed to what President Xi has called a win-win strategy of nation building. Okay, so if you good. could address that. Good. We'll go uh, two people ahead here, and then the gentleman over here in the, blue, uh, in the blue shirt. John Peterson, University of Edinburgh and Center for Transatlantic Relations. To what extent is TTIP disadvantaged by the fact that there seems to be a sequence here? First TPA, second TPP, third TTIP. Good question. Yes, sir. Tom Oakland, National Economist Club. Uh, a quick question, sort of with globalization now being seen as sort of a dirty word and the uh, income inequality, how does uh, TTIP uh, get to the you know, ordinary person? Good. Uh, and let's start with, uh, with Ambassador Reese. We'll work our way this way. Don't feel obliged to answer every question. Just pick the most interesting one, move down, and we'll conclude okay. this panel uh, only a little over time. Okay, I think I can do them all pretty quickly. I think the <coughs> AIIB, first of all, possible to pronounce. Uh, I think that that is not a fundamental uh, 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 decision that's just badly managed. Uh, I think the Treasury had the lead. It's Bretton Woods institutions, Uber, all this. And uh, that I don't think, I wouldn't read a bigger uh, objective into that. To uh, John Peterson's question about the sequencing, I thought in 2009, in my first, in my first contribution to Dan's book, uh, that, that's other book, I thought uh, 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 a TAFTA, as we called it then, or a TTIP would have been much, much better. First of all, we'd get better terms out of a TPP if we had a, done a TTIP first, uh, and it's unfortunate. But the administration was committed to the pivot to Asia, and uh, they were content to wait for the Europeans to kind of come to them. And so seek consequences uh, we're living with. And on globalization, uh, income equality, I, I, I try to t capture that with the Lane Kirkland thing. I mean, it, 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 it's a, this is not a big agreement. The TTIP part is not a big agreement that has huge globalization uh, or, or even NAFTA-like implications because uh, average wages in Europe are very high. Uh, average standards are very high. There's, there's not a debate about whether we're pulling the rest of the world up or being brought down. Uh, the, the, the differences between the United States and the European Union are relatively in, infinitesimal, both in income and in sort of standards protection and, and you know, labor rights and all those other issues. Yeah, uh, just quickly on those, you know, I think the, on, the, on the Asian issue, there was a tactical uh, difference between some Europeans who thought the way you influence that is by being in, in the group versus the U.S. approach that you, you hold out and that's how you best influence. I think it's also influenced by different perspectives on economic interests in Asia, whereas we have a broader strategic uh, view of our uh, responsibilities. And frankly, the EU has more of a one-dimensional view of how they're engaged in Europe, I mean in Asia, and you know, economic interests start to, start to weigh out. So I think there is an influence there. I think the other uh, lesson out of this, though, is that, uh, as the President said, who's writing the rules? Uh, and I think what you see is that the rules are being written more and more in regional groupings than in the multilateral settings. And so all of these, TPP, AIIB, TTIP, you name it, this is where the rules of the future are being written more and more, not at the global level. They're going to come to that level, but it's more of a debate, and we should keep that in mind. The last piece, I think, was actually some of our allies looking at our own dysfunctional, polarized political system and saying, we, you know, we're dependent on these guys, uh, and they don't seem to be able to get back to management problems. They don't seem to be getting their act together. Uh, there were efforts years ago to change voting rules in some of the multilateral institutions stuck in the Congress. Uh, you know, different branches of the government tr basically trying to beat each other up, and countries who are dependent on us being coherent 
look at this and take their own conclusions. So I think that's maybe a lesson uh, back to the implications, the ripples of our dysfunctional polarization at the moment. On TPP versus TTIP, uh, you know, my sim I, 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 just to telegraph it quickly, I think there's a distinction here. Uh, TPP is essentially about bringing countries up to standards. It's about Vietnam. And so many of the traditional groupings, I, you know, uh, labor, environment, consumer groups, they're kind of looking at this in the traditional mode of a trade agreement. As I argued, it's more than that. But I can understand that uh, if you look at it, it's more in the traditional mode than I think has been portrayed. TTIP is about two high standard entities going forward and taking the rest of the global system with them. It's about a completely different uh, uh, level of ambition. And I would go so far to say if both pass, TTIP will have far more impact on Asia than the TPP will have on Europe. Because it's, it's intended to do different things. Uh, and so I think uh, we should just keep that in mind. Last point, which is on the globalization and why should, you know, people care. The biggest source of onshore jobs in the United States is from Europe, by far. Uh, and you can go through all, we do this, all 50 states, you can see how many jobs are due to onshore investments in particular We're gonna have uh, to that, that do that. So I think you know, it's where you live and why it makes a, a difference. And that some uh, areas, like services, where most jobs are, are heavily protected on both sides of the Atlantic. So if you could open up the services sector, you would have the most direct impact on jobs in the United States through TTIP than any other initiative that's on the table today. So those kinds of things, I think, start to make a difference when people understand why it, why it means for their locality or their, or their particular job. Dan Crispin, Kurt Tong, your, uh, your concluding remark. The, the last survey we did at the chamber on the, the domestic support for uh, TTIP was plus 30, 58, 28 in terms of the American public reaction to it. It's less so for TPP, but we're not arguing for any reversal of the sequence. We are where we are on this, but that's, that's the reality. Ambassador uh, Tom. On in the income inequality question, <clears throat> the agreements that are being negotiated now, both, both TPP and TTIP, are very intentionally being structured to have maximum possible positive income effect on middle class uh, workers uh, and, and uh, small and medium enterprises in particular. If, you, if we succeed, and I believe we will, in coming up with frameworks that are transparent and provide uh, more equivalent information about international trade rules to a broader swath of companies, we can start to break out of the 80-20 paradox of 80% of the trade being done by 20% of the companies while 80% <coughs> of your economy is small and medium enterprises. And that getting that 80-20 that Thing fixed a little bit will lead to faster growth and, and have uh, really fortunate, useful income uh, growth benefits, particularly for the middle class uh, uh, um, workers and employees. The uh, on the 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 sequencing, the sequencing is what the sequencing is. The, I, is TTIP disadvantaged? I don't think so. The only disadvantage is, is human resources. To be honest, I mean, there, there's only so many trade negotiators to go around. We've got, we've got a TTIP round next week, and we've got TPP going on at the same time, and people are tired. Um, but that, but they're, they're also really dedicated, and they work hard. That, that's the only disadvantage I can think of. Otherwise, the fact that the TPP will get passed uh, through Congress as a high-quality free trade agreement will just get people used to the idea that the U.S. can do this, and that we can be confident in our ability to negotiate good agreements. And then, and then hopefully, TTIP will, will just breeze right through. The... Um, AIIB, I have a 30-minute answer on that question, <laughs> which I will spare you. But suffice to say that, that um, I don't think, I'm, I'm, I actually have to just, I'm not sure my colleagues got this one right. The, uh, the AIIB is not a proxy battle between the United States and China over control of the global financial system. It's a bank. Um, the U.S. has a, view, a specific view on this bank that we're not con convinced yet that the, the standards are going to be sufficiently high. And we're very, very concerned about these standards as the global custodian for the international finance and development system. Uh, and so we are going to, to focus on standards. Uh, there are other friends who have joined the bank. We did not tell anyone not to join. 
that is a myth that is propagated, and we just heard it again. The, the, uh, what, we, what we do say, both directly to our friends in, in Beijing and to other economies that have joined the bank, is please make it a good bank. And we look forward to having the existing banks working together with the AIB uh, to provide additional resources to address what is a very, uh, very uh, serious problem, which is infrastructure financing. And there's not sufficient financing for infrastructure. Uh, the real answer to that is, is, is better project development and more private sector finance, but the development banks have an important role to play. So we look forward to, to AIB working together with ADB and, and the World Bank uh, in addressing this, but it all does need to be on standards consistent with what has been worked out over the last 50 years. Thank you. Please thank our terrific panelists for a very full discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.